I would like to introduce Jeff Budney, who will be presenting Streaming with Open Caching on the ISP Edge. Jeff is a Senior Manager of Network Planning at Verizon and has traveled to us today from New Jersey. This is Jeff's very first time presenting at Nanog, and it's a pleasure to have him speaking with us today. Welcome, Jeff. Good morning, everyone. I uh, want to start off by just thanking Nanog for this time and all the, the help of the program committee for putting this together and the, the assistance those volunteers gave me. Uh, really appreciate pulling this together and giving us an opportunity to talk about some new technology with the group. So a little bit about what we're going to, talk, going to be talking about today. Uh, really what this is is a description of some uh, project we've had in place in Verizon for a number of years to more efficiently deal with streaming traffic on our network. Uh, we've got some uh, performance comparisons at the end to show you just how well it's working for us in one application. But I also wanted to include sort of a roadmap with this to let anyone that's interested know how can you find out more, how can you get started in looking at this technology, how it can benefit your network, how it can, can, how it can benefit you as a content provider or a CDN. Uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm a senior manager within the global network planning organization of Verizon. My team has responsibility for peering and interconnect uh, for Verizon's public IP networks globally, as well as uh, technologies for efficient caching of streaming traffic within our network. So the two sort of complement each other. If you do better on one, it helps the other. Uh, so I, I really enjoy having those two technologies together with me. A little bit about Verizon, what we're going to be talking mostly about today is that broadband network. So eight and a half million subscribers that we have that's a mix of either uh, our Fios or DSL products or our fixed wireless network, which is our, a growing portion of our network for ser serving users in their home. The uh, Fios network is mostly within uh, the Northeast, Mid-Atlantic region. Fixed wireless is coast to coast. And I just mentioned a little bit more about the rest of the company just to give an idea. It's uh, things that I'm proud of as, as peering manager that we support. Um, but really, you know, Verizon is more than just that broadband network. Uh, we have a global backbone. We support major customers that come looking to us for an end-to-end -end solution. We have a motto that also has a fun t-shirt to it that says, we build the networks that move the world forward. And that's why you see the type of customers that we have and the projects that we take on. Uh, things like some of the government contracts we have for DOD, for the FAA. Um, these are just, you know, just some examples to give an idea of what happens beyond uh, beyond just the home broadband. What we're really going to be talking about today is more about the living room than the office. So I think we've all heard, you know, cutting the cord, this is something that's happening. What does it mean? Uh, what I tried to do in this presentation, again, as a roadmap, is give you an idea of what some of the folks in the media and media and entertainment industry look at when they're trying to determine uh, how they're going to launch a service. Uh, so the the resources that I'm using here, Nielsen, Amdia, uh, are some that are very popular in that area. And just to put some numbers to what we're talking about with this cord cutting thing. Uh, so from Nielsen, a word we've, you know, a company we've all heard of, I think, over time, a lot of history there in terms of tracking television use. Um, what they're doing in the streaming space is they've been saying since last year, uh, you know, streaming has surpassed cable. But what does that really mean? It doesn't really, it's not really speaking network engineer language. So to break that down a little bit, um, when you see you know, streaming 38%, cable 29%, they're looking at the source of the content. So they're talking about whether this is coming from a native streaming service or this is a cable channel. You know, is this Discovery Channel or is it um, you know, MTV that people are watching? And then that, that's how they attribute the viewing time as they're tracking it. Some of those non-streaming categories may also be getting delivered over the top. So if you look at just the streaming 38%, my, my own personal guess would be maybe it's more like 50% of that actual viewing time that's on streaming, right? That's going over IP as opposed to other methods uh, that bypass the internet to get to your home. So interesting fact there. Uh, from the IDEA reports, 
uh, they've been tracking very detailed uh, the business of streaming. So you can see that growth over the past several years in terms of the number of people that have some type of streaming application subscription. And they're predicting that to continue growing. And what that really you know, means to me, kind of another way of to say cutting the cord, is the trend is towards streaming first content sources. So people no longer using their antenna, no longer using their traditional cable service. Um, they're just looking for the app. They decide how many apps they want. And that's how they're going to view their content. What does that mean from the technology side? So some trends that are important to uh, the impact of the internet, the impact to uh, you as an ISP, uh, are on the screen here. So first thing, encryption I mentioned, uh, because this has the effect over time as this, as this has increased of reducing some of the network management capabilities you have in, uh, as an ISP. Uh, so transparent caching is something that we're not addressing today, but it's something that Verizon uses and has used in the past to offload traffic from our backbone. Uh, it only works with HTTP. It doesn't work with HTTPS or any of the encrypted protocols because you don't know what that traffic is. You can't uh, offload it to a local server on your network. Another thing here, multi-CDN or content delivery networks, uh, unless you're one of the you know, biggest of the big uh, streamers that has built your own network, typically what these new streaming services are doing today is they go out and outsource all of this. So they go out and they pick a number of content delivery networks that are going to provide the services for them to deliver to their end users. And they'll pick multiple of them uh, because it makes sense. Uh, CDNs may be in different regions. They may have different levels of connectivity to different ISPs. And the content providers will track that in real time. They'll look at uh, the price. They'll look at the performance. They'll change their contracts whenever they want to change their contracts. So from an ISP perspective, you don't, it's not always coming from the same place. So you don't have uh, you know, that sort of static relationship of, well, if something's happening with Hulu, it's coming in this direction. And then another thing that's been uh, you know, a lot of articles written about it and uh, you know, probably impacted some of the audience personally is what sports leagues have been doing. Right? So they've been giving some exclusive broadcast rights for a certain game or for a certain series to streamers. So meaning you can't watch it on TV, you have to go watch it on the app. Um, if you want to watch, watch certain Big Ten games, you're going to have to watch it on Peacock. You may have NBC on your TV, you may have the NBC app, but it's going to be on the Peacock app for that one game. People are going to chase that. So a little bit now on what we're doing at Verizon from a network management perspective to handle this traffic, to bring it to our end users. Uh, so first here, obligatory ASN information, since it's Nanog. But what we're talking about, again, is our North American network. Uh, Fios is behind 701. Verizon Wireless has its own ASNs. Those are all served by 701. From a content delivery perspective, I benchmark it at, let's say, 15 major content networks that are directly connected to our, uh, to our ASN. It's my own arbitrary count. You can look at our looking glass that's linked from PeeringDB pick your own numbers, um, but that's also spread across all of our major peering locations within the United States. So you start to see sort of the scale of where are all the possibilities that the streaming traffic could be coming from and how it could be getting into our network. So a little more of what that looks like. I think we've all, you know, we've all heard video is dominating internet traffic. Um, and Sandvine is probably one of the better sources that you can look at today to get some background information on just how that's, uh, how that's playing out in the industry. 65% um, 60, that they're tagging is video, but what I like to look at, especially when we're talking about a caching perspective, is look at some of these other categories. So gaming, social networking, audio. Um, a lot of these are also, you know, either also video or there's some other type of repetitive content, something that opens itself up to caching. And that comes up to 77% of the traffic that you're carrying as an ISP to your eyeball networks. And this is not, this is not a static thing. So if you look at, uh, look at some of the reports of Thursday Night Football, again, talking about live sports, uh, that's been carried on five different CDNs plus uh, embedded caches within ISPs. 
And that may change depending on which ISP you are, uh, which day of the week it is, well, obviously Thursday, um, but which, uh, which week of the, of the season, that's gonna change. Again, it's a, it's a moving target. This is something that impacts you as an operator as you're trying to keep up with these requests will come in from the CDNs. We have this game, we have that, uh, and the sports leagues uh, make a big impact that is, on that as well as they're looking for uh, who's gonna carry you know, whichever big game or whichever big series for that year, typically that will change for some of the bigger contests. And that doesn't just mean it's changing to a new broadcaster or a new app, it also means everything else downstream. So the, per the company that has those streaming rights is then gonna go and select their CDNs, the CDNs select how they reach the ISPs, and it's, uh, you know, it's sort of a continuous circle that you go through every year in trying to make sure that you have the capacity you need where you need it to serve the customers. And from an operator perspective, and then everyone in that streaming media chain, this is something that could use some improvement. So what have we done about that? I'm gonna introduce here the Streaming Video Technology Alliance. Hopefully some of you have heard of it. Um, what this is, is an industry association. This is founded in 2014. And its focus is solving key, cha key challenges in delivering high quality video at scale. Uh, I think there's about 11 uh, working groups that are uh, the major components of the SVTA. And what they're focused on is identifying rooms for improvement, making suggestions, writing documents, and ultimately allowing for collaboration between all the entities that are involved in delivering streaming media today. So that's ISPs, it's CDNs, it's the content companies, it's associated vendors, and some of the examples here. If you uh, factor in all the different associated sub-brands of these companies, I think it's about 114 active members that are taking, place, uh, taking part in developing these specifications and releasing them to the industry. Uh, everything then that's published, freely available and is uh, really good reference sources. If you have any type of question in terms of somewhere along that line of from glass to glass, from camera to the screen that you're viewing on, there's probably something that's written on it already by the SVTA. Go take a look at the website and you know, find the background, graph, uh, background information that you're looking for. But what we're zooming down on here today again, is open caching. So what is, what is this open caching thing? Essentially, we're talking about the idea of, well, rather than dealing with uh, bringing all this traffic in at, say, the top of your network from CDNs, let's come up with the ability to move that closer to the user. So an ISP uh, puts a general purpose platform within their network, and we have then have APIs so that uh, the CDN content provider and service provider can coordinate together to utilize that caching resource rather than bringing the traffic across your backbone rather than pulling from the internet. There's uh, 10 publications that we've put out there uh, related to this, and I'm gonna highlight a little bit further down what some of the key ones are that I would, that I would look at first. Uh, but first, we're gonna give a little bit of a look of what this, what this looks like. So some of the key elements of how you put open caching in your network uh, first, at the bottom of the slide here, you'll see uh, the open caching nodes. This is, of course, the most, most important part, that you have that resource within the ISPs, and what we're showing here is multiple ISPs right, can be deploying these caches. And then upstream from that, in between them, the CDN and the content provider, you have what's called open cache controllers. So those open cache controllers are really the brains of the operation. They're the ones that coordinate the availability of those caches, the location of them, uh, logging interfaces, uh, health information, delegation of traffic. That's what the open caching controllers do. And essentially what that, what that allows you is to manage this resource as a whole, right? So at the, as the content provider, you can look down on multiple ISPs and then you have that one open caching interface that if you have to deliver traffic to them, you know you can send it towards that. I'm not gonna bore anyone with the details of the call flow here, but to point out the most important part of this, uh, as I was mentioning the OCCs, in the middle is that content delegation. 
Now, this is something that happens today. There's nothing really new to this. Again, with multi-CDN technology for those content providers, they have to make a decision. Every time someone goes to stream a video, they're looking at where that uh, request is coming from and deciding on what CDN it's going to use. What open caching does is allows that another option and allows uh, that uh, knowledge of the ISP environment to be populated up so that the content provider can use it. A little bit more about what does that do for the different participants. So as a service provider, I said a lot about efficiency, right? So taking traffic off of your backbone. And whether you're a large service provider, or small or medium, um, you'll see that benefit from the large service provider perspective. Um, you know, this is also going to allow you to have an alternative to putting in multiple proprietary caches in your network uh, at multiple locations, you know, imagine all across the country in order to serve just one sim single type of content. If you're on the smaller side of an ISP, this can reduce your internet transit costs to your upstream providers. For both of them, there's the potential source of new revenue. You are providing a service, right? You're providing a CDN service, um, the same as any other CDN that these content providers are using today. And from the content provider perspective, uh, you're extending your reach. Again, you have that management capability for that resource, treat it as a whole to reach all those ISPs. And then you're also seeing some improved QoE for your end users, which we're going to talk about uh, in the back end of the slides. Quick reference in here back to the SVTA of what, are, what I think the key documents are um, in terms of the starting point for open caching. These are the ones I would look at first. Um, and also to point out, uh, number one, uh, we've also coordinated with the IETF, the CDNI working group there, uh, in order to bring these, uh, these methods needed for open caching into some of the existing standards and RFCs that are at the IETF. I also want to highlight, I think I might be the first one publicly uh, to show off some of the work we've done at the SVTA uh, for the uh, document numbering. What happened? There we go. Uh, some of the document numbering that uh, is an easier way to find our resources. So if you want to know any of these specs, the link is in the slides but you can also go in and you can just Google SVTA 2000 and it's just as cool as looking for an RFC. So uh, the board members uh, and I put a lot of effort into that of uh, deciding how it should go. We're very proud that we've entered maybe a new stage of being a, uh, uh, an industry organization. There we go. Um, so what have we done with this at Verizon? What have we been doing to actually implement this technology? So uh, we have, again, those general purpose caches deployed in our network, and we put them where it matters uh, to our end users and where it's convenient to us, right? So depending on how you've laid out your ISP network, you may have floor space in different locations where you have that breakout uh, for uh, routing of traffic and where you have that access to your uh, you know, to your fiber or to your cell sites, uh, you have to put the cache where, where you're actually available to route traffic to the end users. Um, so with Verizon's network, that's something that's further down, we'll show a picture on the next slide, further down from where typically this would be coming in from a CDN. From the usage perspective, uh, this, has been, uh, this has been used on our network, uh, live traffic, live video on demand services, live events, large downloads, a uh, number of different use cases that we've been happy with and that have uh, actually been used with our customers. So to take a little bit about, we'll look at how this looks. Traditional model is on the top here, right? So starting at the right, this is your content provider. They're gonna feed their, uh, their traffic down to uh, what's called an origin shield at their CDN or maybe they run their own, this is sort of their their choice, but that will feed the downstream nodes, either at a CDN and op or open caching, uh, their cache fill so that it can actually to be delivered to the end user. So on the top, again, you see traditional model, bulk of the traffic in orange is coming in from the CDN, 
It's hitting the core network, it's hitting our edge access into, the, into our regions, and then going down into the access network. What we've done differently with open caching, again, you've got that server that's installed down there close to the edge, and instead of the bulk of that traffic being fed across your core, you've still probably got that, that origin, seal, origin shield or you know, content source for the content provider. There's some coordination for that, the open caching controller at Verizon. We're using Quilt for that piece, uh, along with the software on the caches. But that serves as the middleman, again, to determine which cache is this traffic gonna go, where do you point the end user? And then cache fill down from the, down from the origin into the end nodes, and then that is able to provide the actual uh, streaming to your user without touching the rest of your network. So I mentioned we have been doing this internally actually for a number of years, um, but what's key to actually being able to look at performance, know what's happening, and also share it with a group is you have to be the content owner, you have to be the actual content provider in order to do that. So what I've been waiting on to be able to do this presentation is an example of that. So we have an in-house video service, um, live, on-demand, uh, multiple types of content with real customers uh, on our real network. And what that does for uh, me at the operator is that gives me that visibility, end-to-end -end visibility of what's happening for those users. And we're able to benchmark that between open caching and the other CDN that we're using. So this slide is also another good example of what can be helpful from the SVTA. I needed a slide here to show that end-to-end -end workflow. So I looked up the QOE group at SVTA, found a good reference that they have published, and I, I replicated something from my diagram. But this is to show, again, make that example of uh, typically as the operator, you don't know what's going on in the middle. You don't, or you don't know what's going on at the end when the content actually gets to the customer. You just know in the middle, traffic is encrypted, so you don't know if it's a good or bad experience. But as that owner of the player, that software at the client end on the CPE, you can then take a feedback loop to your back end and analyze that and post-process it and find out what's going on. And that's what we've done. So a little bit about what metrics are important to streamers, what metrics are important to content providers. Uh, essentially what everything is here is, are you going to have a spinny wheel on your screen or are you going to see some type of error message? Are you gonna you know, hit the button and nothing happens or you give up and you exit the app? These are the type of things that we're, that we're looking at. Um, so for most of these, what we're doing, uh, we're measuring the percentage of times out of all attempts. Uh, so, for, uh, so for buffering, we're looking at the number of seconds, uh, video start failures, right, number of requests, um, and then sort of different variations of that, right? Is it something that just completely failed? Um, is it something that um, there was a playback error that happened before you got to the end of the video? Um, or uh, the exit, video, exit before video start is the use case where the customer made the request, nothing gets delivered, and they move on. HD performance is something that's probably more specific to Verizon's implementation, and this will vary based on the content provider, uh, what codecs they offer to their, their end users, and what we've been looking at is, okay, we have um, two video resolutions that are both HD that require the highest bit rates in order to be viewed by the customer. So we focus on those and look at, okay, so how much of the viewing on our network is actually hitting uh, those HD rates. And we have metrics on that. So moving on to the next slide, this is, uh, this is our results. So a little bit of background of what we have here. We're showing a comparison between, we have a major CDN that can deliver the content for us, and then we've also enabled open caching. Um, this is a good CDN. It's well connected to our network. The metrics also play that out. Um, but it's a really good apples to apples comparison, same type of content, same users, and let's see what happens. So as you can see across the board, we're talking about very small percentages here, right? So for this particular application, right, everything 
in terms of failure rates is under a percent. But if you compare what we get from the CDN further upstream, as we saw in the diagram before, uh, we're talking you know, about 50% or more improvement over what you can see with the CDN. So that's, you know, that's the type of uh, you know, improvement we've been hoping to see, something that proves out, okay, there is some benefit to that content provider of using open caching. And what I also highlight here is from on that HD performance line, this is hitting over 93% from the CDN. So I think this shows, right, in terms of the bit rates that that can assume, there's nothing holding the CDN back, right? 93%, this is pretty good. But when you look at the comparison to that between open caching, sure, it's only 7% improvement, but you're talking about just over 90% to almost 100%. So I, I think that really, you know, is another aspect where you see open caching uh, shining in its performance and again, speaks back to, okay, what are these background reasons? Why do you want to do open caching? That's one of the reasons why I wanted to, to share this data today. So jumping down into our conclusion, um, again, we talked about, right, what are some of the trends of, uh, of streaming? And from a consumer standpoint, from a content provider and technology standpoint and looked at that, you know, the, that non-static nature of this content coming into an ISP nature, the moving target uh, that we have to deal with as operators and the benefits that open caching provides across the board, uh, whether you're, you're the ISP content provider, CDN or user and showed some real world performance results. And if anyone is interested in learning more, again, I wanted to make this sort of a roadmap to bring you down the road of open caching. Uh, look at the SVTA, look at the, uh, the specifications we linked. And we also have, and this was a, a basis of a lot of the presentation, um, we have a publication in the motion, motion imaging journal that goes into more detail and also talks about some other use cases, uh, but I think is a really good reference. So I shared the link down here below. And with that, if anyone has any questions, be happy to talk more. Hey Jeff, thanks for the presentation. Um, yes, Alex from Cashfly. Good morning, Alex. How are you doing? Um, I was wondering, is open caching a service that Verizon is going to be charging for with their CDNs, or is this? Yeah. Uh, so we're talking about the technical aspects of it here. Yeah. Uh, again, as I mentioned, you're providing a service, right? So depending on how you form that business relationship with the other parts of the workflow, it, it's a potential source of revenue. Okay. And then the other question is on, on the more technical side. Um, how do you provide metrics or guarantee the service for the CDN, like providing the content to the open caching? Because we get great visibility when we own the nodes and own the software mm -hmm. for like the quality of service and how we're delivering that content. Uh, sure. So uh, again, to sort of promote the work that the SVTA has done, uh, one of the things we put a lot of work into is a logging interface, right? So there's a feedback loop uh, from those cache nodes. And that's something that will go back to, it can go back to the CDN or the content provider uh, to be able to see what's happening. Again, this is, you know, multi-CDN is a thing happening today. So this is just sort of an extension of what content providers are already looking for. And we can provide that as well. Okay, great. Thank you. Hey, how are you? I've got an online question from Matt Pitak. I was unaffiliated at this time. Um, you go back to your uh, analytics diagram, it shows the player sending analytics uh, data back to the server. Uh, is that an open API that multiple players support or does this require a proprietary or special player in order to get that analytical data? Uh, yeah, so uh, thanks for the question, Matt. Uh, really, that's uh, essentially proprietary and that's one of the things I was trying to point out. Um, if you're that if you're the owner of the content, the owner of the player, you can see that and others can't, right? So you may be using your own backend, you may be outsourcing that to you know, a CDN or another video workflow provider, um, and you'll be using whatever they're using. Um, so that's not part of the, the open spec, but you need that in order to know what the end result is on the, on the user screen. Thanks for the answer, appreciate that.
Any other questions? All right. Thank you again for the time. Thank you.